So good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, for a great overview. A subject that's not easy to talk about. So, um, so let me, uh, first of all, thank you for your interest in the subject. And um, Ellen, uh, thanks for the invitation. And Kelly, thanks for all your logistical support. Um, so let me, when I talk about this subject, um, and I'll explain why the foundation president in Los Angeles has become somewhat of an evangelist. On, on this issue, I'll talk about that in a second. But um, so I, I just want to define some terms, add some information uh, to, to Patrick's presentation. So um, we hear, in regard to this issue, we hear the term full cost. When we talk about the full cost of, of nonprofit work, what are we really talking about? We're talking about operating expenses, which include direct and indirect costs, indirect or overhead costs. We're talking about annual debt repayments. We're talking about depreciation expenses. And we're talking about fixed asset purchases. So when you think about, when you hear people like myself using that term full cost, that's what we're talking about. Everything that um, is required of a nonprofit to achieve its mission. Now overhead, overhead first of all is not an accounting term. It's a construct of really the nonprofit sector. Um, um, but generally speaking, when people talk about overhead, they're talking about indirect costs. And it, this includes rents, utilities, technology, administration, professional fees, and other expenses that are not tied to any one program, but are vital to sustaining a healthy organization. So those are the things that you can't tie to a specific program, but the nonprofit organization, in this case, needs to, um, um, needs to maintain a healthy and uh, impactful organization. Now, just again, adding to Patrick's presentation, I want to make sure also get into a little bit more detail and explain exactly what this new OMB rule says. What it basically says is that any grantor or contractor of federal funds, be it a federal agency or a, a state agency or a local government, has to do one of three things. It has to, number one, if there is an approved indirect cost rate from the Office of Management and Budget, it's got to honor that indirect cost rate. Has anyone ever in another life gone through the process of, of, of applying for an indirect cost rate? You're all lucky. It's, uh, in another life, I did that, and it's an arduous process. It's not a very fun process, and that explains why a lot of smaller to mid-sized organizations don't have approved indirect cost rates. So that's the first thing. The second thing the rule says, if you don't have an indirect cost rate, but you want to negotiate one, you've got to give the organization an opportunity. Or the third, which is the default position, you have to provide at least 10%. So if you're an organization, and I'll use the organization that I frequently talk about, there's a large organization in Los Angeles called uh, the, the Youth Policy Institute. They have a federally approved indirect cost rate of 27%. 27%, okay? Huge provider of services in Los Angeles. By the time a grant from the federal government goes through the state of California and comes out the other end through the city of Los Angeles, the indirect cost rate that they get is 4%. Okay, so that 20 cent, this goes to Patrick's comment, everyone is taking a bit of that to fund their own operations. So if implemented correctly, what the new OMB rule says, you can't do that anymore. That, that's, that city agency or that county agency, or if it's a direct grant from the state, is going to have to honor that rate. So that's, that's more specific, specifics about what that rule really says, and that's why Patrick correctly described it as, as a game changer for nonprofit organizations. So let me talk about why an institution like the Weingart Foundation is even interested in this. I hope that you'll leave today thinking that maybe this is something worth, worth looking at. So Weingart is a responsive grant maker. Um, we're primarily focused on building the organizational effectiveness of our grantees. 
and our grantees are primarily working in human services, health, education. We fund a fair number of advocacy organizations as well. All of our grantees are working in or for low-income underserved communities. Over 60% of our annual grant making, approximately 30 to $35 million a year, is made through unrestricted core operating support grants, so about 60%. And it's really based on a conviction at our foundation that we believe providing unrestricted funding to reasonably well-led and well-managed and financially stable organizations is one of the best ways to build organizational capacity and sustainability. For anyone who has run a nonprofit organization and you talk to a good, uh, a good, a good, a good leader within the nonprofit sector, they will tell you that there is so much more they could do if they could just get their hands on unrestricted dollars to invest in the organization, to build the kind of infrastructure that is necessary to get all the outcomes that, that we want. Um, it's the nonprofit starvation cycle. So within Weingart, for many years, we have reimbursed um, the administrative and indirect costs of our grantees on program applications. In fact, we have instructed for a number of years our program officers that when they are looking at a program proposal, program, new program development, for example, and they don't see an administrative cost rate or they don't see an indirect cost rate, that they're to ask for it because something is wrong here and also because we know that most nonprofit organizations, quite frankly, don't think they can ask for it, don't think they can show, show it either because the funder has specific guidelines that says you can, or the culture in the sector is such that they assume you cannot. So we instruct our program officers, ask for it, because it's important, because that organization is not going to get the outcomes we're looking for unless it's building healthy infrastructure. It's not going to be able to sustain the organization that we're helping them to grow if they don't have healthy infrastructure. We know that. You all know that. Um, Failing to do that is what Patrick talked about. It just contributes to this thing we call the nonprofit starvation cycle. By the way, one of the authors of the starvation cycle is Don Howard, who's now the new president of the Irvine Foundation in, in San Francisco. And uh, Ann Goggins Gregory has gone, who's the other author, has gone from Bridgeton to um, working with um, Habitat, Habitat in, San, in San Francisco. So, um, uh, so they're still fighting the fight, but different different ways. So, so why, why does Weingart do this? You know, why do we go the extra step and actually ask for the administrative cost? And by the way, we don't do this a lot because 60% of our dollars are going out the door with operating grants. And if anyone wants to talk about that during the Q&A and the difference, I'll be happy to talk about it. First of all, we believe what Ann and Don said in their article Organizations that build robust infrastructure are more likely to succeed than those that, that, that do not. It's very simple. Um, you have to ask yourself why it's okay for a, for a for-profit company in the service sector to have, on average, an overhead rate of 34%, 34%, if you're operating in the for-profit world, in a service-related industry, on average, it's 34%, <coughs> and it's not okay for a nonprofit organization. What, what, what's the difference here? It's because many people, including funders, have unrealistic expectations about what it takes <coughs> to run a nonprofit organization. Now, I'm going to get maybe a little bit provocative speaking to a group of funders. Um, I think that one of the reasons that um, uh, we have unrealistic expectations um, on the foundation side is because we have a lot of people who are working in foundations who have never worked inside a nonprofit organization. And so there's a, there's a lack of understanding there of what it really takes to operate one of these things. The second thing is if you're going to ask a question about indirect costs or administrative cost recovery, you need to be able to do things like read financial statements and un un basically understand nonprofit finance. An area where we spend a lot, as my colleague V will tell you, we spend a lot of time with our program officers doing exactly that. And you can't come to work for the Weingart Foundation unless you've at least reached a middle management position in the nonprofit.
nonprofit sector. In other words, we need people who really understand what they're talking about, what they're looking for, so they can ask the question. Most funders will tell you that they don't have any problems, according to national surveys, asking non engaging with nonprofits um, in discussions about finance. But most nonprofits, when, sur when surveyed, will say it never happens. It never happens. And um, if it does, it's very much on the surface. But for us to get into a discussion with them about something that's really troubling us um, in, 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 on the financial side of the house, we're reluctant to do it because it's, it oftentimes is interpreted as a sign of weakness. So we need, as funders, and this is really the point of our sort of you know, messianic sort of approach to this thing. We have to take the lead in shifting the focus in our grant making from arbitrary notions of cost to outcomes. We all talk about this. We all talk about outcomes. But are we really providing the kind of funding that is going to allow our grantees to actually achieve the outcomes that, that we're looking for? So, that we're looking for. so let me talk about what we know about funder practice in regard to indirect cost rates and administrative cost recovery in general. Um, the short answer, according to um, GEO, does every, everyone familiar with GEO, Grantmakers for Effective Organizations? They do full disclosure. I sit on their board, but they do a, a, a regular field survey. Um, it's called, is grant, maker, is grant Making Getting Smarter? And what their latest survey demonstrates, and it just came out, I think, last week, is that funders rarely cover the full cost of funded work, despite the fact that 74% of the funders surveyed indicated that it is very important to provide support that will strengthen organizations to achieve greater impact. So they don't cover the full cost of the work, but they want impact. They think that's important. So again, it seems like a big disconnect to me and something that we need to get our hands around. The GEO survey also indicated that nonprofits, and this is, goes back to my earlier point, that nonprofits don't feel that funders are willing to talk to them about key financial issues. This includes issues like the need for general operating support, the need to reimburse direct and indirect administrative <coughs> costs, or the need to look at um, liquidity issues around limited operating reserves. One of the things that um, um, one of the things that we have done at the Weingart Foundation, and this really came to the fore in the aftermath of the, uh, of the financial crisis, is we started noticing the limited liquidity that meant most of our grantees had, especially coming out of that crisis. Seventy to eighty percent of our grantees, at one point, um, soon after that crisis, had less than three had, had less than three months. Of unrestricted cash on hand, and many of them had had significantly less. And these were organizations, by the way, that were providing critically needed services. So, in an attempt to provide full cost funding, what we did is we instructed our program officers: when you see that on the financial statements, get into a discussion with the executive director about that. Ask about that, and if there is a willingness on the part of that grantee, we will take a portion of our core support grant and restrict it for placement in an operating reserve if it's, if it's matched and if there is board policy passed for the use, of those, the use of those dollars. It has been wildly successful. I mean, people, again, looked at us and said, you're providing funding to replenish operating reserves? And we said, yes, because if we're going to get these organizations are going to achieve the kind of impact that we're all looking for, we need to do that. They need to have those dollars to invest in themselves. They need to have those dollars um, to uh, withstand the, the rainy day when, when, when it comes. So, um, so, so let me turn, and I know we're covering a lot of material here. And I, I think there's time for questions and answers, right? Um, so um, Let's turn specifically to what we're attempting to do in California around this issue. And it's really a two-pronged strategy. Um, first of all, uh, we have attempted to learn from what the Donors Forum in Illinois has done for the last couple of years. Some of you may be familiar with this. 
where they began looking at the over, overhead full cost issue a couple of years back. The Donors Forum, is everyone sort of familiar with the Donors Forum? It's a unique organization in that um, the Grant Makers Association and the Nonprofit Association have come together under the same roof, and it's in Chicago. And um, so they began, um, essentially formed what um, a learning community to start looking at funder practices around, around overhead and administrative cost recovery in general. And um, it's, it, you know, revealed a lot of things and I think provided funders with a lot of information on how their grant making practices may, may actually be hurting the grantees they're trying, they're trying to help. So we, and people like Ann Goggins Gregory was involved in this and, 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 and we became involved as well. So, we have attempted to model our strategy in California to, to at least learn from their lessons and not repeat some of the mistakes they made, but certainly try to, um, to, try to repeat the things that, that, that they demonstrated were positive. So, um, in, um, in, in, in California, what we, are, what we are attempting to do is use the OMB rule as an opportunity, even though this applies to federal dollars, we want to use the OMB rule as an opportunity to, um, um, to get private funders together, and I'm talking specifically now foundations together, to examine their own, their, their own practices in regard to this issue. So I'm going to take a slight break here, and I'm going to ask my colleague, V. Lynn, who is our director of special projects in, in Los Angeles, who's following this issue real carefully to explain a very unique sort of approach that's coming together with the three regional grant maker associations in California to look at this issue. So I'm just going to step aside for a second. She's a much better speaker than I am. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Fred. Um, so as, as Fred shared, there's um, something what we think is very exciting happening in California around the funder side of this. Um, what's going on is that our three regional grant makers associations, so that's Northern California grant makers, Southern California grant makers, and San Diego grant makers, have uh, combined forces actually for the first time in their histories as far as we can remember. This is how important they think this issue is around an initiative they're calling um, the Real Costs Initiative. It's a two-year project um, slated to start in January. And we thought that you all might be interested in hearing a little bit about the strategy around their initiative and how they plan to reach out to funders and foundations. Um, but the thinking is that the initiative will happen in two phases. One is, is what they call a will building phase, and then the second is what they call a skill building phase. So the first phase, the will building phase, is all about changing the norms in the, um, in the sector and in the culture. And it's about educating funders through convenings and membership forums um, and working to spread awareness about um, the overhead issue as well as the full cost and the real, what we call the real cost issue. So a key part of that first phase is actually going to be um, <coughs> something that we think is, is pretty smart. It's going to start with what's called a small uh, sort of advisory board of core funders, including the Weingart Foundation, who um, are interested in being sort of early adopters to this. So funders who um, believe in the issue um, enough to actually look at our own practices and our own policies and um, applications, for example, and our due diligence practices and the skills of our staff as well, and really work together to think about, well, if we were to change our own practice to support full cost, what would that look like? And what are the barriers that a funder would face in doing something like that? So this um, sort of early adopter special committee is going to function as a peer learning community. It's going to function as a hopefully a leadership body to move the rest of the sector a little bit. Um, and then it's also going to, we're, we're going to be sharing our learnings during this practice, really identifying what are the barriers that foundations would face if they wanted to take this on in, in the nitty gritty sense. Um, and then also developing sort of core messaging for the initiative as it moves forward. So thinking about what would really be strategic to move other foundations. So that's, that's what we call sort of the, the will building phase. The skill, the skill building phase is, you know, hopefully there will be funders coming out of this 
that are interested in exploring what it would look like, what it would take to change their practices. So the, um, the RAGs, the Regional Grant Makers Associations, from the first phase, they're going to be sort of learning from the process, developing a very targeted curriculum um, that they would use in the skill buildings phase, which would actually provide pretty concrete trainings to foundation staff, for example, foundation executives, even foundation board members, about what is full cost, how do you read a budget in, from that perspective? How do you talk to nonprofit applicants from that perspective? So it's going to be a pretty um, hands-on training period. So the initiative will wrap up um, in the summer of 2016. And the plan is to then create a report that shares um, outcomes, learnings, and case studies for um, foundations across the country who might be interested in doing something similar. So that's the foundation side, and then I'm going to hand it back to Fred uh, to talk about the nonprofit side. Thanks, V. Um, and one of the reasons we have chosen that approach is because it goes back to sort of what we know about uh, funder practice in this area in California. It's very interesting. We did a survey a couple of years ago through the University of Southern California's Center for Philanthropy and Public Policy. And what that survey indicated is that most major foundations in California don't have actually hard restrictions on indirect cost rates and over administrative cost recovery in general. They just don't. And so they'll tell you, no, I mean, our foundation really doesn't have any restrictions. Ellen and I were talking about this earlier. And then if you probe that a little bit more and you say, well, then how does your foundation reimburse indirect cost rates, indirect costs? I don't know. Well, we don't really have strong, we don't have written policy on that. We don't have consistent policy on that. So you can follow this along as funders you all understand. So what happens, especially if you're that nonprofit CEO, uh, oftentimes uh, you'll get different stories from different program officers um, because there is no policy. So one of the things, Time. Is it yeah. time? Okay. Um, so, so anyway, um, I was taking a little bit longer than I thought. So, um, so anyway, that's that's the reason for the approach. Can I have two minutes? Yeah. Okay. So, let me tell you about the other approach. So, this the approach that uh, V explained is I think seven funders have come together. Yeah, and it's statewide funders from San Diego to San Francisco. So, funders are at least through their pocketbooks are acknowledging that this is an issue that's worth looking at. Here's the issue that you all need to understand about the OMB rule. There is no immediate compelling reason for state government, county government, city government to pay any attention to this new rule. In fact, state governments routinely ignore OMB rules. They get their hands slapped maybe in an audit, but there's not much of an enforcement mechanism. So that's a concern. If this is in fact going to be a game changer, somebody's got to make sure that our folks in our capitals and our city and county government actually pay attention to it. So what we are doing is, as a foundation, and we're doing this along with the California Wellness Foundation, is we are marrying, if you will, our statewide nonprofit organization, California <coughs> Nonprofits, with one of the state's leading uh, public policy strategy firms. It's an interesting firm. They, a piece of it is public policy strategy advisement, and other piece is straight lobbying. But this is a very powerful, well-respected firm, and not. And this firm is going to advise California nonprofits on an advocacy strategy initially aimed at state government in Sacramento um, to get them to understand what this OMB rule is all about, to try to understand how they're going to respond to it. And once we understand what that response might be, <coughs> we're assuming it's probably going to be negative, um, what we can do to sort of, um, uh, sort of um, stimulate a, a different kind of response. So we're going to do that initially at the state level, and we're also going to use LA County and city as, a, as another pilot case, because we have 45,000 nonprofits alone there. And um, so it's, it's, this is an important, uh, important place to start. 
So it's a combination of using this as, an, <coughs> as a way to get private funders focused on this important issue, and it's also an advocacy piece trying to get state and local government to actually do the right thing and implement, implement this rule. So, sorry for going over time. <laughs> Do you want to do, do Q&A or do we want to introduce the small? Yeah, we want to move right Okay, all right, I'm going to come back up. Okay. All right. And I know you Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, both Patrick and Fred. Thank you. So um, is your head ready to explode yet? Because this is difficult. And what I forgot to mention before was that we wanted to break out into a little bit of small group discussion uh, to explore some of the questions yeah, I haven't. Some of the questions around this, I mean, because, like, you can, it all started with me, you know, where I heard overhead ratio in this ruling, and I used to revert to caveman language when I want to say things like, overhead ratio, bad. I knew that, bad. Piper, good, because we, <laughs> we believe that overhead ratio is bad, but then I thought, well, what are we actually doing about this? And you realize, well, we didn't really have a consistent policy. So these questions are here to kind of help you think to delve in, because you, you instantly might also say overhead ratio bad, but it doesn't mean that you know what to do about it. So we wanted to, we have four questions here. We wanted to invite you to perhaps divide up according to the question that you think is most interesting to you, explore it for like the next 10 minutes or so, and then we'll report out very quickly as a group and, um, and just take it from there. So I'm not sure, that kind of means you have to get up and move. I don't know if you're against that or... <laughs> <laughs> tables can choose to tackle a question. Question number one, how do you identify overhead when nonprofits apply for funding? Do you, how do you do that? Uh, do you have a preset overhead rate? And if you do not, do you ask applicants to identify the full cost? Kind of what Fred was talking about with the program officers. Do you get in there and say, tell me about the full costs? Are there points of pushback and resistance to doing this? And do you feel your foundation can invest differently and more fully supporting nonprofits in their work. That's kind of an open question, but it could refer to general operating, it could refer to capacity building, it could refer to a lot of things. So um, maybe what we'll do is we will designate uh, tables one, two, three, and four. Tell me if you're against this, and you have to move according to which table you want to do. That would be table one, two, and back there, three and four, or you can just Pick amongst your tables right now a question you'd like to tackle. Do you prefer the latter? Yeah. Okay. So I leave it to you guys to make a determination what you want to talk about. Any of them are fair game. And if they got through one, they could go on to two. Yeah, if they're overly ambitious, they could do more than one. Yes. So please. Uh,